You know it. We know it. Next year is creeping up quick. If you want to win inside your niche in 2024, you need tech that puts you in the pilot seat. The new HubSpot Sales Hub will help you close out the year strong and kickstart your success for 2024. Teams can collaborate on every inch of the customer journey and keep operations running smoothly with a comprehensive prospecting workspace and powerful sales analytics tools that keep data connected across teams. They'll help you whip up assets and execute tasks that used to take hours out of your workday. HubSpot Sales Hub lets you accelerate every facet of your sales operation with precision. And with over 1,400 integrations, there are tons of ways to mix in new features. So finish out Q4 strong and gear up for the new year with HubSpot Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com slash sales. Good morning, everyone. It's Friday, September 8th. I'm Mark Dent here with Lestrandra Alfred and Juliet bennett Ryla, and you're listening to The Hustle Daily Show. For the second day in a row, we're coming at you live from Boston. That commotion you're hearing is the great American sound of networking and people getting ready to watch us instead of Derek Jeter, who apparently is giving some speech right now that nobody cares about. Because what really matters is this podcast that we're going to present to you. Today, we are going to talk about how this was the summer that showed the power of women's spending. But before we get into all that, let's just go over the top news in business and tech. All right. Starting off, people are finally really having to go back to the office. It's official this year. The walls are coming down. And this has made people pretty distraught after three plus years of not having to go in. And people are reacting by spending lots of money. Uh, According to the Wall Street Journal, we're talking to people who are buying Teslas for the commute, people who are spending $1,000 on record players and vinyl for their offices, and for like just these extreme entertainment setups for when they get home so they can feel good. So Les and Juliet, what would you guys buy? What would be your comfort purchase if you had to go into an office? And by the way, we don't. We're lucky. Right. Very lucky. I would have to go with like the capitalism core desk setup of standing desk treadmill underneath so I could feel like I'm walking and enjoying my life in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I would buy the most expensive noise canceling headphones in existence to block everyone out. (laughs) Yeah. But I think, Les, you had kind of mentioned that there's no physical sort of good that would make you happy in place of being able to work from home. No, I mean, nothing's going to get you that time back from commute and, you know, no material good is going to offset that. No, I so I, I think my purchase would be kind of a community purchase. I would just buy like a couple of office pets, like really good ones, <laughs> a really expensive dog mm-hmm. and a really expensive cat. Like I would find the most expensive one possible. <laughs> I think it's probably like a Devon Rex, maybe. Done. Those little hairless, like they're not hairless cats, but they're they're very similar. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Love it. All right. So let's go on to a story about AI. The most notorious AI musician is back. Ghost Rider, Mm -hmm. a few months ago, developed a viral Drake and Weekend viral song that featured the voices of Drake and The Weekend. And people kind of thought it was real for like 12 hours and then (laughs) realized it was totally fake, Mm -hmm. as did the record labels. So anyway, Ghost Rider has now done the same thing. But with 21 Savage and Travis Scott, Ghost Rider released it on TikTok and left a note for Travis Scott and 21 Savage saying like, hey guys, DM me if you're cool with this and you can share the royalties or just tell me to take it down. Uh, Julia, this kind of seems like a a semi-risky idea for Ghost Rider. Yeah, because I don't think it's up to Travis Scott or 21 Savage. I think we saw in the case of Drake, it was Universal Music Group was like, no, take this down. And I think that would be the same thing. It would be up to the record labels. And also... What do they care about royalties, honestly? Like, royalties are such a pittance. They're like, yeah, doesn't matter. They're really going to want that three hundredths of a cent uh, <laughs> exactly. that features their fake voices. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I just feel like maybe the DM communication is not the right chain of command for communicating that message. But yeah, I, I, and I have a feeling that the, the record labels will not be communicating through DM <laughs> to yeah. Ghost Rider. So let's go to our last little brief here before we get to the big story. And this one is for all the pickleball haters out there. And to all the pickleball haters, congratulations, because this is really good news for you. Tennis is back. 
the U.S. Open, which has been going on for the last couple of weeks, is bringing in incredible amounts of money. There are roughly three times as many tickets that have been resold on StubHub as last year. And so that has meant $700 nosebleeds and $20,000 courtside seats. And also a lot of cocktails being sold. Les, you saw some really absurd number about the Honey Deuce, like the signature cocktail from the US Open, I think from last year's. Yeah. So last year, they sold 405,000 Honey Deuce cocktails at $22 a pop, which was almost $9 million in sales. This year is probably going to be pretty similar. So that's some serious cash just for the drink. $9 million for a cocktail. And it it is so popular that they have it on draft. So it's not even like really a cocktail anymore, I would argue. And yet, you know, $22. I think people buy it for the cup. Yeah. More than the drink. True, true. (laughs) All right, so let's move on to the main story. I'm going to mention a couple of other numbers that are vastly larger than even the U.S. Open could uh, think about, which is that so far this summer, Barbie has made around $1.38 billion at the box office. If we consider the spring and into the summer, and and there's going to be a little bit into the fall, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour is projected to gross $4.6 billion, and Beyonce's tour, $2 billion. That's an awful lot of money. And these are largely women-driven kind of pop culture mega events. And a lot of commentators have been saying, welcome to the era of post-pandemic pent-up spending. People are just like, I don't mind spending $600 on this concert ticket. But Les, you think it's something that's a little bit bigger than that and something that has been building for a while? It's definitely been in the making. You know, women's economic power is not anything new. But in previous generations, we saw a lot of women putting their money directly back towards their families. For a long time, a stat that was thrown out was that women who earned income outside of the home would bring 90% of their money back to the family. But what we're seeing over the past few decades is that not only are women earning more because they're working more, they're delaying having children, if having children at all. And then we've also seen things like the self-care movement really highlight like, hey, women, here are some things you can spend on yourself. So women are beginning to have more money, more agency over how they spend their money, and they're wanting to spend their money on things that bring them joy. And, and it seems like this summer just seemed to be like a culmination of all of those forces that had been building for a while and then just colliding with the fact that truly the three biggest, I'd say, pop culture events of this year yeah. are, like we said, Barbie, Taylor Swift, Beyonce. Yeah. Things where you could just go dress up, enjoy with your friends and just have fun. Yeah. And so interesting is that it's not just Warner Brothers, Greta Gerwig, Taylor Swift, who are the ones who are, you know, making all the money. They're certainly making most of it, probably especially Warner Brothers and Mattel. But there's also like this cottage industry around all of this, Juliet, where we've seen like entrepreneurs and largely women entrepreneurs who have found ways to have a business around the era Mm -hmm. or, or around Barbie. Yeah, we've seen a lot of fashion retailers catering to people who are going to go to one concert or another or to the Barbie movie. I know all the thrift shops in my neighborhood moved all of their pink clothing to the front yeah. right before Barbie was about to release in theaters because people were dressing up. There's a lot of people on Etsy who have apparently made a considerable amount of money selling Taylor Swift friendship bracelets. Mm-hmm. And these are moms, just people they can do it at home. They're fairly simple crafts and they're repeatedly selling out of these friendship bracelets, which apparently people wear to Taylor Swift concerts. Yeah, I mean, one of our freelancers for The Hustle did a story about Taylor Swift merch, like t-shirts, sweatshirts, things like that. And I mean, there are some people who have been able to quit their full-time job and now start crafting full-time based on the strength of these Taylor Swift sales. Mm Mm-hmm. That is unreal. And we've also seen for the cities, these tour stops have been going to, the local economies have gotten a really big boost. Cincinnati got a really big boost in their hospitality when Taylor Swift went. A lot of the beauty service providers in Philadelphia saw a really big boost when Beyonce was there. So we're seeing an economic ripple. Yeah. In my hometown of Kansas City, like the tattoo parlors saw absurd <laughs> business that weekend from people getting Taylor Swift ears tattooed. Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, it very widespread. Yeah. So I'm wondering, I, I want to like think about about the future for all this. These three big events are, are not going to happen every year, obviously. So I don't know, Les, what's your takeaway for how this will continue to be long lasting? It has, of course, been building up for decades, but making sure that these spenders, this audience is continued to be catered to. Yeah. I mean, I think what 
Taylor Swift, Beyonce, and the Barbie movie did really well is they knew their audience and they spoke directly to them. So I think it goes to show that audiences will turn up and they'll turn out when they feel seen, when they feel heard, and when they feel like they're spending in alignment with their values. So that may not necessarily mean make more movies about toys. Yeah, right. But it does mean that if you want to reach an audience, have your message be in alignment with what that audience wants. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you, everyone, for listening here in Boston and everywhere else around the world. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig, and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We have a lot more tech and business coverage for everybody in our newsletter. So if you're not subscribed, please get signed up at the hustle.co slash email, and we will catch you next week. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Puri. My First Million features famous guests like Alice Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern, went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire, thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts. 